continue our lectures about unscriptural innovations introduced by men into the New Testament church. So now we're going to consider an innovation that was introduced hundreds of years after the New Testament church began, the use of mechanical instruments of, mu instruments of music in the worship. And of course, as so many have mentioned before me, the, the example of Nadab and Abihu to Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, continues to serve a very important example for us today in regards to rendering worship to God. Put simply, when they offered and worshipped something other than what the Lord had commanded, it was taken by the Lord as a sign of disrespect for His holiness, and it cost them their lives, and the Lord struck them dead, dead with fire. And of course, as has been mentioned, this, these are examples that were written for our learning, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. As children of God, we are to be holy before the Holy One who called us, 1 Peter 1, verses 4 through 16. Therefore, it's important to treat God as holy, and we do that by worship, by doing exactly as He instructs in His Word. To be sure that we do this in regards to our music and worship, which is my topic, it's important for us to consider what the New Testament has to say first about the nature of worship in general, and secondly, more and more specifically, about the kind of music in the New Testament worship. So let's consider what the New Testament says about both these points. We'll start with the nature of worship in general. And we'll begin by noting the different types of worship that are mentioned in the New Testament. First, Jesus refers to true worship, or specifically true worshipers, in John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. This is the type of worship expected by God today. He tells the woman of Samaria in verse 23 of that passage, The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And we'll deal more with true worship in detail a little later. But secondly, Jesus refers to vain worship in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9 when speaking to and about the scribes and Pharisees in Jerusalem, <clears throat> calling them hypocrites and quoting prophecy from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, where he said, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So vain worship is the result of following the commandments and traditions of men and ignoring the command of God on any particular issue. Also, when worship is not from the heart, for their hearts are far from God. Thirdly, Paul refers to ignorant worship in Acts chapter 17, verse 22 and verse 23. Standing on Mars Hill in Athens, Paul said, Ye men of Athens... I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. <coughs> this is worship that's offered in the absence of knowledge of God's will concerning who he is and how he is to be worshipped. Fourth and last type of worship uh, uh, that's mentioned in the uh, uh, New Testament is will worship, referred to by Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. This worship is a res uh, result of doing what we like, what we desire, what we think is good without regard for the Lord's will, and when we do that, we are guilty of will worship. The exercise of human will and the freedom that it implies is compelling. The phrase will worship means self-chosen worship or self-made religion, however you want to phrase it. The desire to worship God in our own way has always been appealing to man. <clears throat> but will worship is not taught in the Word of God, as Nate Evan and Abihu found out and paid for it with their lives. It should be evident then that not just any worship is acceptable to God. There are different kinds that can be offered. 
but only one kind is acceptable. Since God will only accept true worship, we better understand what's involved. What does the Bible say regarding acceptable worship? What is God's will on the matter? Those are the questions we need to be asking. Worship is either right or wrong depending on, upon God's will. The only right worship is that which is authorized by God. So let's examine the meaning of true worship. How does Jesus define true worship? Let's look at that passage again in John chapter 4, just verses uh, 21 through 24. He said, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither at this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. I might point out right there, he's contrasting between uh, incorrect or false worship and the true worship that the or at least concerning a, a location where we are supposed to worship, the Jews were following. But then he goes on to say, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So now we're talking about contrasting with the correct worship that Jesus was talking about versus what was to come, which was New Testament Christianity. And there he says, he goes on to say, God is spirit. And that phrase is not stuck in there for just any reason. He points out, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice the word must. What does this say about how we worship? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 tells us we're to worship God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And John 4, 24 tells us that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But what is meant by that phrase, in spirit and in truth? Looking at the full context of John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24, we notice the contrast that I pointed out earlier between being made by Jesus. Unlike the Samaritans who worshipped incorrectly uh, on the mountain uh, Sychar, Jesus said the Jews had been worshipping correctly by going to Jerusalem in verse 22. But now the time was coming when the place was not important as it was under the Mosaic law. Thus the contrast is now shifted between the, their false worship and the, the Jews' correct worship to the contrast between Old Testament and New Testament worship, or between worship under the Mosaic law and New Testament Christianity, the law of Christ that was soon to come. Somehow, Old Testament worship had not been in spirit and truth, but the New Testament worship would be. The contrast becomes clear as we define what is meant to worship in spirit and truth. So first, let's consider worshiping God in spirit. You know, most of us quote John uh, chapter 4, verse 4 and 23, kind of apart from the context of the full passage, and understand this to mean to do so with the sincerity of a devoted heart and mind or heart or from the heart with the right attitude. And I believe this is the way that we should worship, as taught in passages throughout the New Testament. But here in the context of chapter 4, it doesn't seem to fit with the idea that Jesus is making a contrast between Old and New Testament worship. And I say that because worshiping with sincerity from the heart was required just as much under the Old Law. Consider the passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, a familiar passage to most of us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when they sit us in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Sounds like a, from the heart, a, a sincerely devoted heart with the right attitude to me. So perhaps a better understanding is that to worship in spirit means to offer spiritual worship. This would be a, in contrast to worship that is physical or fleshly, as under the old law and a contrast that seems to be in harmony with the differences between the Old and New Testament worship. 
Jesus began verse 24 by saying, God is spirit. Therefore, the worship of him is to be spiritual. That is more in keeping with his nature. This understanding is in harmony with what we've learned elsewhere when, uh, about the contrast between Old Testament and New Testament worship. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, we learn that Old <coughs> Testament worship consisted of fleshly ordinances. For example, a physical structure, the tabernacle, special clothing for the priest, lampstands, the burning of incense, animal sacrifices, instruments of music, all of which appeal to the physical senses. But New Testament worship is geared more toward the spiritual side of man. God's temple is spiritual. It's made up of Christians. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. All New Testament Christians are priests. A royal priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 9. Romans 12, 1. Hebrews 13, 15. Our prayers are as sweet incense. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And our music is singing and making melody with the heart. Ephesians 5, 19. The physical ordinances of the Old Testament were to last until a time of reformation, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9 and verse 10, which has occurred with the coming of the new covenant. <clears throat> to worship in spirit, then, is to offer up spiritual worship as taught in the New Testament and not physical as found in the Old Testament. Now let's consider worshiping God in truth. What is meant to worship in truth? Isn't it to worship according to the Word of God, God's truth? Well, without a doubt, we should always worship according to the commandments of God. But again, this doesn't fit with the idea of Jesus making a contrast between the Old and New Testament in John 4. Because in the Old Law, God said, You shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God hath commanded you, you shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Deuteronomy 5.32. That was a worship according to truth in the Old Testament too. Worshiping according to commandments of God, His truth has always been the case. If you wanted to worship correctly, you did it according to His commandments. To worship in sincerity with a devoted heart and, and life that underlines your worship acts and according to God's revealed truth is the perfect pattern for our past, present, and future worshipers. It always has been. But then again, notice Jesus said in John 4, verse 22 and 23, that the Jews were right in their worship, but the time was upon them when the true worshipers would worship the Father in spirit and truth. So the contrast may not have just been between true or false worship, like we discussed with the uh, Samaritan woman, but between worship under the Mosaic law and that which was to come, meaning the New Testament law. And I say that because worship to God according to His will was required under the Old Testament, even as it was in the New. False worship has always been condemned by God from Genesis to Revelation. The contrast between Old and New Testament worship seems to be between that which is true and that which had been a shadow pointing toward the truth. Many elements of Old Testament worship were simply a shadow or a figure of what was to come. The tabernacle was a symbol, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. The law with this worship was only a shadow of that which was to come, Hebrews 10, verse 1. Christ is now in the true tabernacle, heaven, Hebrews 9, verse 11, verse 12, and verse 24. Therefore, we should expect the worship of the true to be different than that of the shadow. And we have already seen that to be the case. The Old Testament worship, which was but a shadow, was physical in nature. But New Testament worship, which God now expects of true worshipers, is according to the true realities God is spirit, Christ is in heaven, and worship is now spiritual in nature. So considering <clears throat> the nature of worship in general, we see that there are different types of worship, but only true worship is acceptable to the Father. 
It is a spiritual worship which is in harmony with the truth concerning God's nature, since God is spirit, and the location of the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. This is in contrast with the Old Testament worship, with its fleshly ordinances, which served only the shadow until the true New Testament worship arrived. So moving on to our next major point, let's examine the topic of music, or more specifically, the kind of music in New Testament worship. Let's break this down into three parts. <clears throat> First, we'll take a, a peek at history and what scholars have had to say. This should help us understand that the kind of music to be used in New Testament worship is supported by what many historians, reformers, and scholars have said on the subject. Secondly, and more importantly, we'll examine what the Bible teaches about the kind of music God wants in the New Testament worship of the church. And we'll see that it is definitely a true spiritual music, unlike that found in the Old Testament. And lastly, we'll take a look at some justifications offered by others for the use of mechanical musical instruments of worship, which we will counter with the truth from the Bible. Lest people think that we are unusual in this view of using only vocal music in New Testament worship, of uh, choosing not to add mechanical instruments in worship, Let's start with a look at references on music in the New Testament church. Note the voice of history here in the writings of music historians and scholars from the past concerning the early church. And you're not going to know a lot of these names. I didn't either until I studied on this. Um, Paul Henry Lang, a Hungarian-American musicologist and music critic educated in Catholic schools, wrote in his 1941 book, Music and Western Civilization, on page 53 and 54. All our sources, and I quote, all our sources deal amply with vocal music of the church. They are chary, meaning cautious, they are chary with mention of any other manifestations of musical art. The development of Western music was decisively influenced by the exclusion of musical instruments from the early Christian church. Hmm. Hugo Lechtentritt, and I apologize to Mr. Lechtentritt if I mispronounce his name, a German Jewish musicologist and composer who traced the development of Western music from the time of the Greeks to the 20th century in his 1938 book, Music, History, and Ideals. On page 34 wrote, and I quote, Only singing, however, and no playing of instruments was permitted in the early Christian church. Hmm. Emil, Emil, I guess is how you pronounce it, Emil Nauman, scholar and composer, published several works on musical aesthetics and history, including the history of music in 1886. In volume 1, page 177, he wrote, There can be no doubt about the that originally the music of the divine service was everywhere entirely of a vocal nature. Dr. Frederick Lewis Ritter, a German-American composer and author, in his 1884 book, History of Music from the Christian Era to the Present Time, on page 28 wrote, quote, We have no real knowledge of the exact character of the music which formed a part of the religious devotion of the first Christian congregation. It was, however, purely vocal. And last year, Lyman Coleman, an American scholar, an author as well as a Presbyterian, I might add, in his 1844 book, The Apostolic and Primitive Church, on page uh, 368 and 369, wrote, quote, Both the Jews in their temple service and the Greeks in their idol worship were accustomed to sing with the accompaniment of instrumental music. The converts to Christianity accordingly must have been familiar with this mode of singing. But it is generally admitted that the primitive Christians employed no instrumental music in their worship. Notice that the music was entirely vocal in the early church, according to uh, these historians, at a time when instrumental music was quite common in the temple worship of the Jews and in the idol worship of the Gentiles. <coughs> Apparently, early Christians understood the New Testament worship was to be a spiritual worship which is in harmony with the truth, obeying the plain commands to sing in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, which we'll cover in more detail later. 
Well, that's enough from music historians. They're kind of boring anyway. Let's uh, continue our exploration of history, though, and uh, listen to the voice of various religious sources. Now, this ought to be interesting. What have different religious organizations, including men influential in the founding of numerous denominations that still exist today, what did they have to say about using mechanical instruments of music in worship? Well, how about the Catholic denomination? We'll start there. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 10, page 652, I quote, Although Josephus tells us of the wonderful effects produced in the temple by the use of instruments, the first Christians were too spiritual a fiber to substitute lifeless instruments for or to use them to accompany the human voice. How about that? I had a memory there, David, of you and I at a Catholic church in, <laughs> in Central Texas. Uh, I have been baptized with holy water. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, what about the Greek Orthodox denomination? According to Constantine Cavardos in his 1956 book, Byzantine Sacred Music, the execution of Byzantine church music by instruments or even the accompaniment of sacred chanting by instruments was ruled out by the Eastern Fathers as being incompatible with the pure, solemn, spiritual character of the religion of Christ. How about the Presbyterian denomination? They're pretty popular around here in high school. Uh, John Calvin, theologian, pastor, and former uh, reformer during the Protestant uh, Reformation and a principal figure in the development of Calvinism, wrote this in his commentary on the book of Psalms, volume 1, page 539, regarding Psalm 33, verse 2. He said, quote, Musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting up of lamps, the restoration of other shadows of the law. The papists, therefore, have foolishly barred this, as well as many other things, from the Jews. Men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends to us by the Apostle is far more pleasing to him. I wonder what the Calvinists today would think of that. What about the founder of the Methodist denomination, John Wesley? Uh, what he has to say about mechanical instruments, music, and worship? Mr. Wesley was quoted in Adam Clark's commentary on volume 4, page 685, that I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they're neither seen nor heard. Well, okay. Uh, speaking of Adam Clark, uh, who is a Methodist denominational theologian, biblical scholar, and commentator, uh, he wrote in his 1817 book, The Holy Bible with a Commentary and Critical Notes, concerning uh, Amos chapter 6, verse 5. He said, quote, I'm an old man and an old minister, and I here declare that I never knew them, speaking musical instruments, I never knew them productive any good in the worship of God, and have had reason to believe that they were productive of much evil. Music as a science I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music, and, I, and here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity. Well, one more. Let's consider what's been said by Baptist denomination author and pastor Charles H. Spurgeon. I told someone recently, I tried to study with a Baptist, and he kept on to argue against what the Bible said, using the Spurgeon notes at the bottom of his Bible. Anyway, um, Spurgeon preached to 20,000 people every Sunday for over 20 years in the Metropolitan Baptist Temple, uh, Tabernacle in London and never used mechanical instruments of music in his service. When asked why, he quoted 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. He then declared, I would as soon pray to God with machinery as to sing to with God with machinery. Spurgeon also wrote in his commentary on Psalms chapter 33, verse 2, One can make melody without strings and pipes. We do not need them. What would hinder, uh, that would hinder rather than help our praise. Sing unto him. This is the sweetest and best music. No instrument like the human voice. <laughs> 
You know, Spurgeon's beliefs regarding the use of mechanical notes from music to accompany vocal singing would not be well received today. Brenda, I went to a, 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 a funeral in uh, Madisonville in there at the Baptist Church and had to shove all the musical instruments to the back so they can make use of the stage. Most Baptist churches today conduct their Sunday worship assembly with the use of mechanical instruments and music. But why would we expect men to listen to the voice of history, including their own denominational founders, when they won't even listen to the Word of God in their Bibles? Why did these men of history, men of various denominations, object so strongly to mechanical instrument, uh, instrumental music in their worship? Though they were wrong and continue to be wrong in other areas of truth today, concerning this, they properly realized that such was a carryover from Jewish worship. That as such, it was out of harmony with the spiritual nature of New Testament worship, that it rightfully belonged to the old law and its shadows and not the true worship of the New Testament, and was contrary to the plain commands to sing that are given in the New Testament. So as interesting as these quotes were, the really the most important thing we need to look at and for us to consider is the teaching in God's Word. Truth as it's set forth in the New Testament. So let's consider as the Bible defines such the kind of music in true worship. We'll begin by noting that the only music commanded in the New Testament was vocal. We need to pay very close attention to what God has authorized when we consider the kind of music in our worship to Him. It doesn't take long to review the examples given in the New Testament on the subject when you gather them together. First, when looking at singing in the, in the, uh, in the New Testament, there's the example of Jesus and His disciples that takes place after the institution of the Lord's Supper and before they went to the Mount of Olives in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. There we read that when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And the same words are repeated in Mark chapter 14, verse 26. And I realize this is before Christ's death on the cross and that the law of Moses is still in effect. But this is the first reference to singing in New Testament as they sung a hymn. The next example in your Bible occurs while the New Testament is in effect. And this is the account of the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16, verse 25 tells us, And at midnight Paul Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And once again, we find another example of singing as they sang praises unto God. Now I realize the guards probably not going to give them musical instruments if they wanted them, that they were just going to have to sing. But still, that's the next reference. The other New Testament references include the following. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. Romans 15, verse 9. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also, as I quoted earlier, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3.16 I will declare thy name unto the brethren, and in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. James 5.13 And the last three references in the New Testament occur in Revelation that records what John saw in heaven, not on earth, during his vision. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof. Revelation 5, 9. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. Revelation 14, 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Break the marvels of thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of Saints. Revelation 15, 3. So it doesn't take long to gather up the songs that mention singing and look at them. Now, as we circle back, we're going to examine Ephesians and Colossians, the Ephesians and Colossians passage in a little bit uh, more detail. So let's note the music in the New Testament emphasized the spiritual. Let's remind ourselves exactly what Ephesians 5.19 says. Speaking to yourselves 
and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. By the way, I don't know of a trumpet that can speak, but anyway. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The phrase making melody in this verse uses the Greek word solo, meaning to twitch or twang, that is to play on a string instrument to, uh, to make melody, uh, melody to sing songs. Under the Old Testament law, mechanical instruments were plucked or played in the worship to God. But since the death of Christ, we are under the New Testament law, and at no time anywhere did the early Christians solo or play on mechanical instruments of music to God, as we just read related New Testament verses. Also, no scholarship can be produced that will verify the contrary concerning the early church, as we read in the historical accounts earlier. The instrument with which the New Testament plucks as he sings the Lord is specified in the verse. The only instrument authorized by the law of Christ, man's heart. When singing, the Christian is making melody in your heart to the Lord. The Apostle Paul confirmed that. Notice the inspired Apostle declared that the instrument is the heart, not a mechanical instrument. Christians are to worship God in spirit with the instrument being the heart. God is not material. He is a spirit. He is not created, but the creator. God accepts worship of the man, not material instruments made by man. God wants and deserves worship of man himself, his own creation, and not some mechanical instrument made by the hands of men. Notice the contrast, the heart, that's spiritual, versus mechanical instruments, the physical. Again, the worship in spirit is to offer up spiritual worship as taught in the New Testament and not physical as found in the Old Testament. Since this music is to be offered to the Lord, we had better regard Him as holy and offer exactly what He specified. Remember our lesson about Nadab and Abihu. Let's quickly review Colossians 3.16 in a little more detail. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, which instruments and don't do. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This verse is parallel to the passage in Ephesians 5.19. Perhaps we need to be reminded that singing is more than that which comes from our lips. Keep in mind that the passage indica indicates singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord in Ephesians 5.19. And, and similar to Ephesians 5, he which is singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. A discussion regarding the heart shouldn't be necessary in order for this command to be understood. It seems clear that what comes from the lips is preceded by that which comes from within the individual. Jesus stated it in very easily understood language in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. They're speaking to the Pharisees, old generation of vipers. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So out of the mouth will come that which expresses the heart of the individual. Think of this next time we sing. Are you singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord? Are you singing with grace in your heart to the Lord? Is your heart right with God? Are you worshiping acceptably? Remember that what comes from the lips is preceded by that which comes from within the individual heart. And notice once again that the contrast remains clear. The heart, spiritual, versus mechanical instruments, music, physical. So let's review uh, the contrast between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship that we've just spoken about. Old Testament. Music was performed by Levites, assigned to sing, more or less a choir. 2 Chronicles 23, 18, 29, uh, 28, verse 30, verse 31, many other places. It was accompanied by various mechanical instruments, singers with music, 2 Chronicles chapter 23, 13, trumpeteers, 2 Chronicles 29, 28, singing with loud instruments, 2 Chronicles 30, 31, the harp, Psalm 71, 22, and is shown in the, elsewhere in the Old Testament. What was the emphasis? How it sounds to the human ear. It appeals to the physical side of man. Now compare that to New Testament. 
Music is sung by all in the congregation, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. The melody is being made in the heart, not the harp, the heart. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. What was the emphasis? How it affects the spirit of man, his heart. It appeals to the spiritual side of man. Music in New Testament worship, therefore, is to be spiritual in emphasis. It is to be sung by all with emphasis not on how we sound, but that we are making true melody in our hearts to the Lord. Finally, let's consider some of the justifications that are offered for the use of mechanical instruments and music. A common justification in denominational churches is this. It has always been a tradition in our church. Well, not really. As history reveals the use of instruments to be an innovation introduced hundreds of years after New Testament church began. In many cases, it's been used only during the last two or three centuries. But even so, as traditions of men, it qualifies as vain worship, per Matthew 15, verse 9. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You also hear this. I don't see anything wrong with it. That's pretty common. If you're not familiar with what God has specified in the New Testament worship to Him, then your worship is ignorant worship. For you are not aware of the kind of worship God commands of you. If this is your position, you need to study your New Testament Bible. Remember what Paul told the men of Athens in Acts 17, 30, 23. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Another common response is this. I like it in my worship to God. But most of the time the response is even shorter. But I like it. This is will worship. As mentioned in Colossians chapter 2, verses 20-23, as we mentioned earlier, the desire to worship God in our own way has always been appealing to man. If you do this and you're worshiping like they have it by you, offering that which you like, offering that which is profane, for God did not command it. But will worship is not taught in the New Testament Bible by God and His Word. Worshiping like Nadab and Abihu will cost you eternal punishment unless you repent and worship correctly as God directed in His Word for New Testament Christians. The most common justification you may hear from denominations is it's found in the Old Testament. Well, hopefully we can kind of touch on that today. Many times this is ignorant worship because they are simply unaware of how the Bible authorizes or how to establish biblical authority, meaning they think they can go back to the Old Testament to argue their case. When someone wants to argue for the Old Testament, it must be pointed out that there are a lot of acts of worship under the Mosaic Law which were imposed until a time of Reformation, as noted in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10. That time has shown in Acts chapter 2, and it's already come. And now God expects His people to worship differently, as Jesus pointed out in John chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Besides the fact that God may have commanded something in the past, does not mean He approves of its use now, especially when He's revealed what He does want. Consider the sin of Moses. God first told him to strike the rock uh, for water, in Exodus 17, verses 5 and 6. Later, God, at a different time, told him to speak to the rock in Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. But Moses struck the rock as before, and so doing his sin. He lost his right to enter the promised land, Numbers chapter 20, verses 19, uh, 9 through 12. His sin? He did not treat God holy by doing only what God had commanded at that present time. Understand that God may have allowed instrumental music in the past, in the Old Testament, under the Mosaic law. But he now commands vocal music in New Testament worship. Finally, one last false justification and we'll wrap up. Almost on time here. Sometimes you'll hear people try to argue incorrectly. The Bible doesn't say not to use mechanical instruments. In other words, they argue that the silence of the Bible gives consent. And wrongly believe that a thing is alright for worship unless explicitly forbidden. According to this approach, the New Testament does not say 
Thou shalt not use the instrument. So it must be acceptable to God. There are logical consequences with this argument that cannot be ignored, and it can easily be demonstrated that this type of reasoning will not work. When God commands men to do anything specifically, everything else in a related category is excluded. For example, unleavened bread and fruit of the vine are the elements that God has ordained for the Lord's Supper. According to Matthew chapter 26 and 20, verses 26 through 29, we're all familiar with those passages. The specific divine requirements for these elements excludes everything else. No one I know would be foolish enough to persist upon adding meat and potatoes to the Lord's table just because the New Testament doesn't expressly prohibit their use for this purpose. Of course, I can think of that some milk, but I'd take that over uh, meat and potatoes, but... That's not allowed either. There are two kinds of command in the Bible, specific and generic. For instance, the command, make thee an ark of gopher wood, is given in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, is a specific command. God specified the wood. That settled the question of the kind of wood. God did not say, thou shalt use no other kind of wood. But the fact that God limited the wood to gopher wood forbade the use of any other kind. Now if God had said, make thee an ark of wood, that use of a kind of wood would have met a generic command like that. He could have used pine if he wanted to. That's probably what we would have used here in East Texas anyway. If the New Testament had simply said, make music, the commandment could have been complied with by either using vocal or instrumental music or both. God, however, did not say that. He said, sing. And that restricts the kind of music to vocal music. The specification and limitation is as clear here as, if the, as the command to build an ark out of gopher wood. So, wrapping up, let's not make the same mistake as they have in the Bible and die in our sins. As we approach God in worship, let us treat Him as holy by worshiping as he is commanded, in spirit and in truth. Let our music be singing with melody in our hearts as the, as the Lord, as God has commanded, and not with melody made with mechanical instruments of music, because the underlying theme on every one of these innovations is this, because it's not authorized. That's the bottom line. And every one of these lessons you're going to hear, last night and today. Thank you for your time.